Thank you so much, and it's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. My name is Elżbieta Karolczuk, and I'm a sociologist and feminist activist working both in Poland and in Sweden. And Agnieszka Graf. Yeah. Uh, my name is Agnieszka Graf. I'm an American studies uh, scholar and feminist working in Warsaw. Um, coming from Poland, um, it makes us think a lot about what's going on uh, right now in Ukraine, because it affects us all in so many ways. So we would like to propose just a moment, you know, one minute of silence or maybe commemoration, because some of our friends have died and some of them had to flee the country. And I guess we all need to think about the ways in which we can support their efforts to stop the war and also to maybe make their lives livable while it is still going on. Thank you so much. Um, coming from where we are coming, we tend to be the bearers of bad news, but hopefully we are also the bearers of knowledge. And today we will be talking about um, our years, seven years long research, which has um, been published in the form of a book. It's open access, so if, if you are interested, you can take a look and download it. And uh, probably one thing that we should say uh, at the beginning is that um, during the, today we were talking mostly about gender critical positions or transphobic positions coming from broadly defined women's movement or people who identify in some ways with uh, feminism or at least that's what they claim. We will be talking about and we are focusing on in our research on those organizations, actors, intellectuals, politicians who are openly ultra conservative. So we are looking at the other side of the anti-gender discourses and those are mostly um, well, in, in our research we look mostly at Europe and of course Poland specifically, but this trend is not definitely limited to Europe. You can also see those trends in Latin America, United States, Africa, uh, Asia, and basically all over the world, because it is a global movement. And we know that it's been a long day, so we'll try to be organized, clear, and maybe a bit pedagogical that we would be otherwise. otherwise. Uh, so uh, we even have a sort of five points that we will uh, talk about today. So we will start with basically telling you who are they, who are those people, those actors and organizations that are behind the anti-gender campaigns. Uh, and we want to stress this global aspect because I think that we really have to understand that what we are dealing with in our respective countries is not just country specific. We will talk a little bit, um, Agnieszka will actually, about the intellectual roots of anti-genderism. And of course, uh, gender conservatism or gender essentialism is part of that, but definitely not the only uh, source of this trend. I would like to discuss in some detail uh, what we call the anti-colonial frame, which is a key discursive tool, uh, very flexible and very, I would say, um, easily traveling across borders. And then uh, we will try to present the ways in which the anti-gender movement has become presented and has functioned as reactionary response to neoliberalism. And we will, of course, describe what we mean by that. And finally, we would like to present to you the key concept which we present in the in discuss in the book which is the opportunistic synergy because quite a lot of us ask the question why now right we i mean homophobia transphobia misogyny i mean these are not news right these are not new uh, trends but we can see very clearly how those actors have emerged as key actors in many contexts and how they become much more visible than they were before and opportunistic synergy 
which focuses basically on the relationship between anti-gender movement and populism and right-wing populism in, um, specifically, allows us to see this rise as, uh, in a way, inevitable, which doesn't mean that necessarily successful. But we will start with basically um, linking to uh, linking the cultural war uh, with the actual war. Okay, um, I want to get us started with a quote. This is a quote from Patriarch Kirill, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, quite recent, uh, from early March, where he um, justified uh, the invasion of Ukraine, which was coming up, but he was talking about Donbass at the time, um, as follows. For eight years, there have been efforts to destroy what exists in Donbass. What exists in Donbass, he explained, is a rejection, a principled rejection of the so-called values that are now being offered by those who lay claim to global domination. Today, there is a certain test for loyalty to that power, a certain pass into that happy world, the world of excessive consumption, the world of illusory freedom, do you know what that test is? It's very simple and also horrific. It's a gay parade. The demand to hold a gay parade is in fact a test for loyalty to that powerful world. And we know that if people or countries resist this demand, they're excluded from that world and treated as alien. So this is to introduce you to the language of the right wing um, anti-gender movement. This is very different from what most of you have been talking about today. Um, this is a discourse in which local people are presented as naturally and obviously conservative, the people on, of Donbass, and they are being attacked, dominated um, by a corrupt and consumer-oriented West. This is the second element that's really important. Um, the gay parades are, equ uh, are the equivalent of a word of consumerism, of global capitalism, which is alien. And they resist this world va valiantly, and they need to be helped. Now, who is going to help the people of Donbas defend themselves against the corrupt, evil, horrific forces of the West? Of course, it's going to be Putin. And who is helping Putin? Well, of course, it's Patriarch Kirill. And this is the sort of dynamic um, we've been looking at uh, in various locations, right? The assumption of local um, conservatism and global corrupting forces associated with, in this case, gay parades, but in more generally speaking, gender, and the need to defend um, these local people serving as a justification of violence. In this case, um, you know, a lot of violence. So the question, of course, is how to think about this uh, new wave of anti-gender mobilization. Is it something new? Is it something old? Is it just backlash that we know for quite well, thanks to Faludi and others? We propose to think about it as a new wave of opposition in which the very concept of gender uh, becomes, uh, becomes an equivalent of chaos, perversion, danger to family, to children and national uh, identity and the goals of the anti-gender movement vary from context to context. Um, internationally, especially in Europe, it would be the Istanbul Convention, right? The idea that we need to uh, protect women from gender as a Trojan horse that becomes uh, this kind of, you know, disguised um, beast that will eat up gender differences and, of course, we will actually be detrimental to women. Um, but, of course, in countries such as Poland, it will be abortion, as usual, I would say, and unfortunately also successful. Uh, it will be opposition to any piece of anti-discriminatory legislation that uh, that is aimed to uh, 
better the situation of uh, minorities, women, um, uh, people who are discriminated against. It will be in some context um, uh, new reproductive technologies, especially surrogacy becomes uh, one of the key points um, in countries such as France or Italy. Uh, it is uh, also um, issue, these are also issues connected to, uh, to um, uh, broadly defined um, sex education and also gender studies. So we are the genderists here who are, uh, you know, going out there and snatching the children. And of course, to some extent, it is a continuation of uh, the culture war of the 80s and 90s in the United States. If you, we already talked about this uh, trope of, you know, um, uh, gays by that time uh, and trans people today as, um, as uh, baby snatch snatchers, right? The, the, the those who corrupt children because they cannot reproduce, that therefore they need to recruit. But I, I think that um, also we see this uh, continuous influence of Vatican uh, in its opposition to gender mainstreaming, which started in already in um, 80s and 90s. Um, and of course, uh, a decades-old conflict around modernity. But at the same time, we can see that it is um, also, especially you can see it in Europe, uh, an attempt to establish a new moral, uh, global moral geography in which the East becomes the repository of traditional values, traditional family, um, uh, the real you know, men and women, the roles which are uh, ascribed to, to both genders. And in this new, um, new um, um, geography, we from the East are going to save you in the West, finally. We want, we, we will be able to stop, you know, catching up, you know, getting better. Finally, you are in the position that you will be saved by us because you need it because of this, you know, moral degeneration and all those horrible ideas connected to sec sexual education and, um, uh, and what happened in uh, 1969. So, uh, I wanted you to take a look at these pictures because um, there is this tendency also amongst us to think about this movement as a top-down only. And definitely it is top-down in many respects. But I think, and this is something that we, um, that we actually put a lot of effort into, um, I think we really need to understand why so many people are buying into this narrative. And of course, we can think about manipulation, but as a sociologist, they always have the problem with, you know, false uh, consciousness um, thesis. I think that we really have to understand what kind of anxieties, what kind of discourses these groups are able to tap into, because these are often issues connected to uh, things that we as left-wing feminists also think of as important, like, you know, job precarity, like the instability of the living conditions, like the lack of childcare, and so on and so forth. So this is, of course, uh, this is actually the picture from the World Congress of Families in Verona in 2019, which I happened to be at, and it was a very interesting experience. So this is a picture which actually shows this kind of opportunistic, opportunistic synergy between politicians such as Salvini, by then the leader of, um, of the state, basically luckily no longer, and the representatives of the World Congress of Families, uh, both uh, in the United States and locally in, uh, in uh, Italy. But we also can see, you know, uh, actually in Brazil, and this is the protests against Judith Butler visit to uh, Sao Paulo, that has mobilized thousands of people signing petition against her presence and also burning her effigies in this kind of almost um, you know, exorcistic effort to get rid of, of this gender influence. And on the left-hand side, you have the protests in 2013 in France, where hundreds of thousands of people went to the streets against uh, so-called Tubira law, um, allowing um, um, homosexual um, couples to also adopt children. So the idea was that, uh, you know, Lay people, ordinary citizens, have to unite in um, in the effort to safeguard the family. So it is often uh, these protests often take uh, take form of mass mobilization. 
But of course, if we look closely at the actors who are behind that, we will find very well organized um, networks and international organizations. And they have very different roots, actually. If you think about, um, well, basically, in my, in my uh, research, I often um, I look at civil society, and it's quite interesting that civil society, especially today, is often brought about in the context of, you know, civil society will protect us from democratic backsliding and will save democracy, but we don't really realize that civil society in terms of, you know, organizational forms such as associations, foundations, and so on, can have very different uh, ideological outlooks. So this is the part of civil society which can be called liberal civil society or ultra-conservative civil so society, which um, um, has been which has different type of connections and roots. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples, of course, we have religious fundamentalists there, we have Catholics, sometimes they're aligned with the Vatican, but some of them are quite, I would say, in contrary, especially to more sort of liberal or progressive ideas of Pope Francis. We have, of course, evangelicals, the usual suspects. We have some Protestant groups, we have Orthodox Church, but quite a lot of those organizations either hide their religious connections or they remain unaligned. And uh, a couple of, uh, four, I would say, key um, transnational networks uh, give you a, can give you a sense of who these people are. The World Congress of Families have been established in 97 in the United States. Uh, from this moment, in cooperation with some Russian uh, pundits and uh, civil society actors, uh, and they have been quite, I would say, successful in organizing um, those world congresses, bringing together basically elites, right? Politicians, civil society elites. In Verona, for example, there were even some zombie aristocrats talking about, you know, how wonderful it is a family if you have a castle. Uh, there were also uh, some entrepreneurs and some kind of shadowy figures, you know, uh, like Malafiev, who is this sort of, you know, a go-between person between um, Putin's Russia and, um, and other countries. Uh, but other organizations, such as uh, Political Network for Values, are try to create this kind of respectable image of um, global organization, uh, consisting mostly of active or former politicians who try to forge transatlantic alliances. Right? So the idea is that we have to have cooperation and so on and so forth. Um, others, such as Tradition, Family and Property, which origina originated in Brazil in the 60s, have their roots in opposition to communism, uh, very ultra-Catholicism, and also very neoliberal stance. And they have been active, I would say, they established franchise in many other countries, such as France, where actually they run into troubles because their educational institutions have been termed uh, sectarian, but they have been also active in countries such as Poland and Ordo Juris Institute, which is a key player on the, on the Polish context and also emerging star uh, regionally, I would say, um, has been established with the help of uh, TFP. Uh, and also we have those organizations such as Citizen Go, which have a quite short lineage. It has been established in 2013 in um, Spain, and it basically emulates the ways in which progressive groups uh, try to uh, organize over the internet, right? So they organize petition drives around issues from, uh, you know, opposing the um, uh, the, pros the prospects of liberalization of access to abortion in Ireland, um, opposing, you know, some kind of series on uh, Netflix featuring um, queer um, uh, protagonists, and so on and so forth. And they are quite um, active. They have 17 um, versions in, in terms of language, and they are also very active in terms of getting money in small donations from uh, activists. And uh, in that sense, you also have countries where you have 
um, a trend without the actual movement. And it, it, Sweden is one of those examples where we have public intellectuals such as even RP, uh, who has been um, warning against the dangers of gender ideology and of gender studies, even though he's not really a leader of the movement, right? And it also it's also interesting how flexible those frames are, because in Poland, of course, um, there will be a, a religious elements in the narratives of anti-gender actors, but in the Swedish context, he would say, for example, that, anti -gen that gender studies are dangerous because they are non-scientific and they are religion-like, right, based on faith, based on uh, beliefs rather than science. So as you can see, it's a very complex and well interconnected map. When we started our journey into um, anti-gender movements and anti-gender studies, because there are conferences in Poland devoted to debunking gender, there were efforts on the feminist side um, to clear up the misunderstanding. For instance, the uh, Plenipotentiary for Women's uh, Rights in Poland set up a website explaining what gender really is to clear up the misunderstanding that was, um, it was suggested that the bishops just didn't get it. Well, the bishops knew what they were talking about. Um, Anti-genderism is a robust worldview, um, which may not be correct from our point of view, but it is internally coherent. It is a robust worldview with a history, um, with a set of images um, that repeat from country to country, um, with a certain effective power. Um, let me start us off with a quote. Um, this is a quote from uh, Jacobo Coe, um, Vice President of the Italian organization Pro Vita e Familia at the World Congress of Families in Verona, 2019. He proclaimed that his movement was against, in a struggle, against ideologies of death that destroy man and human reality. This is a quote. If the mother is no longer the one who gives birth and the father is no longer the one who begets, then children can be bought and gender is decided within the mind. And if every desire becomes a right, this means that at stake is not only a new model of society, but a whole new paradigm of humanity. This is the kind of Manichaean um, and sorry, um, an apocalyptic vision uh, that this worldview hinges upon. The idea of gender is like a magnet. Um, it attracts a number of ideas that can be associated with chaos, with the blurring of boundaries, but also with moral decline, as well as consumerism, individualism, the devaluation of motherhood and fatherhood, um, the threat to families um, and especially to children. And finally, the destruction of humanity and civilization as such. And you, when you hear this, um, you know, the first time you, you, you find it odd. The, by the hundredth time, it's like a language um, that you, you, you find people are speaking. Um, so the, the, these are the general ideas. In practical terms, there are all these things that uh, Adrieta has mentioned, like the Beijing, uh, like the, um, um, uh, trans rights, um, assisted reproductive technologies, gay rights, equality of marriage, and so on. But I want to focus on these bigger ideas, on the worldview um, that anti-genderism presents. And the core elements of this worldview um, are gender essentialism, the idea that, of course, there are two sexes, and they're rooted in biology or God's will, um, depending on the context, God will or will not be mentioned. And the gender binary is not only self-evident, but it is morally good. And any departure from the gender binary um, is sinful and dangerous. This idea goes back to Vatican's policy of the mid-90s when the United Nations started introducing the category of gender into its major treaties and agreements. And so if you want to trace, that, tra trace this um, idea that gender is evil, 
within the Vatican's um, policies, you have to go back to 1994 and 1995. The Cairo Conference on Population and Development and, uh, and the Beijing Conference on Women. There were delegations there that were not really noticed by feminists at the time of conservative women. One of those women was Dale O'Leary, um, an ultra-conservative Catholic journalist from the United States, who wrote a pamphlet called The Gender Agenda, which was later developed into a book. Um, and reportedly, this pamphlet was read by the Pope, and she was the one who alerted the Pope to the danger of gender. The gender Agenda was framed by her as an international conspiracy of elites against ordinary women. So this idea that gender is dangerous to women was actually born at that time, and the idea that it is women that need to be protected against gender studies. The second uh, and perhaps older genealogy that is, I think, obfuscated uh, by the movement itself because of its, uh, well, um, somewhat questionable elements is anti-modernism. In other words, this is a story of recent or maybe not so recent history of the West. Um, and I say recent or not so recent because the question is where does it all begin? A story of decline, a declension narrative. It's a story of corruption, um, of contagion, of contamination, of the decline of the West. In some versions, uh, the decisive moment in 19 is 1968. Um, it's cultural Marxism uh, and uh, the, the fe feminism that develops from uh, cultural Marxism. But in some versions, it goes back to the French Revolution and even further back to the Illuminati. Um, I traced uh, one of those connections, which at first I couldn't believe, it was so bizarre, between Gabriel Kubi, who is uh, a pundit of the, um, uh, uh, of the, of the anti-gender movement, uh, presented as respectable, a German sociologist and author of a number of books, and um, a man called E. Michael Jones, a radical traditionalist Catholic from the United States, uh, who has not been an established academic for some years because of his open anti-Semitism. This is a man who basically believes that uh, Jews uh, have corrupted Western civilization through the spread of homosexuality and especially pornography. Um, and this strand of Catholicism uh, uh, um, has actually been uh, um, uh, marginalized by the Vatican. The, these are not legitimate Catholics anymore, um, uh, which of course is a sign of decline in their books. Anyway, Gabriel Kubi has a number of footnotes um, leading back to Michael, uh, to Michael E. Jones, but without uh, the anti-Semitic element. In other words, th the origins are there if you scratch the surface, but without the with, without the link that would, uh, that would lead you to the actual history. That history, I argue, is very relevant because it provides the structural backbone to this ideology. This backbone is conspiratorial, it is Manichaean and, ap and apocalyptic, and it is a scapegoating narrative. In other words, it's not that the West declined on its own. Someone is there to blame. That someone used to be called Jews, and that someone is now called well, depending on the context, gay, gender, feminist, um, recently um, the, the category of transgender is very often uh, picked up. But the structure is the same, and you see the excitement around Judith, Judith Butler, for instance, and, not, and this is of course not just in Sao Paulo, but also if you read the literature. Um, it's not a coincidence that George Soros and um, Judith Butler are very often mentioned in these narratives. Um, so there is, a con there is an anti-modernist conspiratorial um, uh, um, subtext to this narrative, although you, you don't get it in the official documents of the movement. The official documents are framed as a defense uh, of Christians who are supposedly discriminated against in liberal societies. So they've picked up on the language of um, progressive movements, obfuscating their, um, uh, their origins in, in more, um, uh, in less reputable uh, uh, intellectual um, uh, sources. Another part of this narrative that you would not necessarily hear in Western Europe, but that does come to the surface in Eastern Europe, is the connection between um, uh, the uh, conspiracy to um, turn children 
gay or trans, turn women into feminists, and depopulation of these regions, leading eventually to the Great Replacement. I'm not telling you one story which is present everywhere. These are very flexible narratives, but we have, we have quotes in our book that show a very um, uh, obvious link uh, between the anti-gender discourse and the great replacement uh, theory, which of course is central to radical right, uh, right wing um, and identitarian movements all over the world. And an important discursive device which allows for these ideas to fly, so to speak, um, is the anti-colonial frame. Uh, so basically it is, um, we can call it, well, a hijacking of, um, of anti-colonial ideas, uh, which basically means that uh, those actors are using the anti-colonial language or specific concepts um, in a ways in which uh, they become the ultimate victims of the ideological uh, and also economic um, colonization. Um, and this plays differently in different countries, of course, but the main element is the process of vilifying the progressive movements as the actual colonizer, co colonizers. So this is the moment where the history of colonization and the uh, role that, well, the Catholic Church, the Vatican has played in it and also other denominations uh, becomes obscured. And what, uh, what uh, sort of appears is the role of uh, genderists, um, LGBTQ plus activists, uh, liberals, in promoting uh, those um, allegedly alien ideas of sexual freedom or right to, to identification uh, into the innocent others, the people who are always presented as traditionally minded, locally rooted and, um, and authentic. Uh, so in that sense, um, it allows not only to reverse the um, victim perpetrator positions, but it also brings about quite powerful affective frame, which becomes um, a justification for violence. Right? Because at the end of this process of the uh, victim perpetrator reversal, what you get is the actual violence which is staged, which is presented as self-defense. Right? We have to protect ourselves from those who are trying to colonize us. And that, of course, connects in different countries. In Eastern Europe, for example, as I already mentioned, this connects with the sense of uh, turning shame of being inadequate, of, of being the second Europe into pride for being the ones who are finally able to uh, shed the, the colonization of the West. And that, of course, connects to this new moral geography of Europe, which is basically anti uh, EU stance, if you really scratch the, 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 the surface. Uh, what is really interesting, and it also connects to, uh, to our um, first, uh, uh, first uh, keynote, is that uh, is, is this notion of uh, gender as contagion. Right. One of our texts, uh, we focused on this metaphor of, and this is actually um, um, a transparent that we uh, that I took a picture of during um, um, a protest which took place in Poland, which says, "Gender is Ebola for Poland from Brussels." Right. And we don't think that the um, the, the, the choice of Ebola as this sort of metaphor here is, um, is just an accident. Um, because the, what is at stake here is not only um, to present gender as something that is contagious, but also something that is stigmatizing in a way. The body through contact through uh, bodily fluids, of course, if we think about Ebola as an actual disease, it is a horrific uh, type of disease. It is something that people are immediately afraid of, but it's also horrific in, its, in the ways in which it develops and in which it kills the host. So that, of course, shows this trend of transforming 
the actual history of colonization and the uh, colonial remnants of those processes into a wholly new story about how the world really uh, works. And of course, in the Polish context, and that's what Agnieszka already said, is that uh, the idea is that we have to protect ourselves from uh, the colonization because the colonization has different stages. The first stage is to sort of uh, disrupt the gender order, uh, make family um, something that doesn't exist anymore, um, m turn children into the, the people who don't know their own identities. And once you do that, of course, and this is basically a racist um, device. It is a racist narrative because what is the ultimate danger is that uh, the people, the, the, the dangers of mass migration are looming in the, in the distance, of course, right? So the idea is that Eastern Europe is to, be, is to become or is to be made into a buffer zone uh, in which uh, people will be uh, devoid of their traditions, their values, their norms, and therefore they will be open for mass migration, which will ultimately allow the West to exploit those regions. And of course the question is how these narratives connect to the question of actual exploitation to neoliberalism. It has been argued by historians of anti-Semitism that at its core, modern anti-Semitism is a response, a reactionary response to economic inequality. Now, I would never argue that uh, anti-genderism is simply anti-Semitism in disguise, although if you read Michael E. Jones, you might come to that conclusion. Um, what we do argue is that the same function that anti-Semitism played in late 19th and early 20th century um, is played by anti-genderism today. In other words, anti-genderism is a reactionary response to neoliberalism. It is, of course, a reaction to real changes in the re realm of gender, of the gender order, of all those things that are being protested. They're, they're, they're really happening, and it's okay not to like them. But the fact that this dislike it takes the shape of a conspiracy narrative, of a moral panic, um, shows that something more is at stake. In other words, that this narrative is responding to some deep needs. Now, what are those needs about? We argue um, that what we call neoliberalism is called gender, gender ideology, consumerism, by the reactionary right today. Now, how do we define neoliberalism? Of course, it is an economic doctrine. You know it better than we do because you had Maggie Thatcher in power for quite a while when we were still in the midst of state socialism. Not that happy, by the way. Um, so it's an economic doctrine um, and a governance regime that includes privatization, the erosion of the welfare state, austerity policies. I don't need to tell you about those these days, right? But it's also a cultural paradigm. It's a certain atmosphere. It's a way of thinking and feeling about human lives, which at its core is about individualism. It's about choice. It's about the idea that people make free, rational choices and that they're responsible for those choices. In other words, if you're poor, you made all the wrong choices. If you're rich, you made all the right choices. Um, Human autonomy and responsabilization um, create this ethos um, in which people feel scared when they fail, in which they feel ashamed rather than connected to other people who might be helping them. Now, this landscape, this cultural um, landscape is described in moral terms by the anti-gender movement. And this description includes um, images of terrified children who need to be protected about this onslaught of what is referred to as sexualization or gender ideology. It includes children. Um, you can't see this very well. It's a wonderful image, um, very chic, coming from the Italian anti-gender movement. This is a baby with a barcode. It's just been sold and it's riding in a supermarket trolley, um, being taken away by these very slick gay men. 
clearly rich. Um, the image at the top comes from a campaign that we um, examined qu at qu quite some length. It was a Polish campaign, a video that went viral in 2014, about a woman who has put off her motherhood for so long that she will never have children. She has been to Tokyo, she's been to Rio, she's rich, she has this beautiful Western-looking house. But the video is filled with um, voices of children that sound like the kind of ghostly children that were never born, right? In other words, lost opportunities to be of happiness um, caused by uh, consumer culture. Children destroyed, commodified by consumer culture um, and terrified of being kidnapped by this uh, evil world. So what we show through our analysis of this imagery, but also the, the, the actual arguments being made, is that we are dealing here with a different um, scenario from what is usually described in the American and British context, namely the collusion between neoliberalism and uh, conservative uh, family values rhetoric. I think this connection is taken for granted by people who examine conservatism uh, in the US and Britain, because this is how um, neoconservatism actually unfolded throughout the 80s and 90s, right? The idea that free market economy leaves us without protections and therefore we need family values to create this, these protections. Well, anti-genderism enters a different, um, into a different um, collusion with right-wing populism. Elzbieta will explain how that collusion works. And it is not in itself um, um, an ideology that is um, supportive of um, the free market. Instead, it is an the, the idea is that families should function as um, protective uh, communities uh, and that the state should actually cater to the needs of families. So as the anti-gender movement uh, pre presents itself as a defender of the poor and presents gender ideology as a weapon of the rich, remember George Soros is funding it all supposedly, um, the, uh, the, the people who um, advise populist governments coming, the people from the right wing, uh, from, sorry, from the anti-gender movements advising populist uh, governments in countries like Hungary and Poland actually um, offer solutions that do have a redistributive uh, element of it. We describe them in terms of welfare chauvinism. Um, one of the uh, flagship um, policies of the Polish government is the so-called so 500 plus um, uh, policy uh, where families with children get uh, regular handouts uh, every month. Uh, at first it was just for the second child, now it's for all the children. So as a mother, for instance, I, I benefit from this idea. Um, uh, so what, what is happening here is not a collusion between um, free market economy and family values, but a different kind of um, alignment. And this alignment we call opportunistic synergy, and Elzbieta will uh, describe it in the final section of our presentation. Yes, so we are nearing the end. Um, so, as I said, we were wondering why is it now that we see this growing strength of anti-gender uh, movement, ultra-conservative anti-gender movement, and we think that this is because of this a strong relationship between anti-gender movement and right-wing populism or authoritarianism as it as it as it seems and we call it an opportunistic synergy uh, and the thing is that of course ideologically you know people such as Kaczynski have quite a lot of connections with uh, let's say anti-choice groups but these connections are not inevitable and we can see over the years how people especially such as Salvini have become much more invested invested into this anti-gender rhetoric. So he wasn't the sort of, you know, family uh, values promoter and, you know, cross kisser from the very beginning. He has begun this path because he knew that there is something politically attractive uh, that would help him to attract more voters. So what it is in it? On the one hand, you know, populism is a um, as we define it after Kasmuda and others, a thin-centered ideology. So basically, uh, populist 
um, leaders or populist parties are often on the lookout for much more robust ideological projects to make sure that they are able to perpetuate this division between elites and the people, even though they become the ones in power. So they become the elites, right? So in that sense, they are always on the lookout for not only the, uh, the ways in which to show that there are divisions of power or hierarchies of power, but also they want to moralize this division. So the political conflict is no long conflict is no longer just a disagreement about you know what kind of policies do we want. It is a manichaean fight of good you know versus evil, and that's why vilification of progressive movements is so important here. Um, and in that sense, it's a very uh, effective affective politics right so this is really something that makes people feel that they are on the right side of history right that they are defending those innocent children that they are doing the right thing uh, and also what they did is to really especially if you look at the countries such as poland hungary and a couple of others they are really able to link this cultural narrative about family values with actual welfare chauvinist uh, uh, family policies and they are of course restrictive right in the polish case uh, they at least until recently they didn't include for example migrant communities or refugees with the ukrainian uh, crisis this has changed and we are really keen of you know in looking what will happen with that but in the um Hungarian context, for example, those all those uh, family policies are mean tested, which means that, for example, Roma families will be excluded from them. Right. So this is basically this idea of, you know, state support for our families, for our children. Um, and it, but it's quite interesting how um, how invested they are in it, because I was quite amazed by, for example, rep representatives of the World Congress of Families, um, the, the CEO, Brian Brown, who is an American, talking about, you know, that we should support families, we should support, you know, people who have children with disabilities, we should get money for, uh, for maternal care and so on. I was like, wow, you should do it in America, you know? Have you heard about the fact that they don't have universal, um, you know, uh, support for um, maternal, um, sorry? Maternal leave, yes. So uh, it, I was quite amazed by that. But this is, of course, very effective in terms of um, propaganda. And on the other hand, the ultra-conservative actors gain from this alliance, of course, power, of course, uh, the possibility, and this is the case of Poland, where they, tr when the movement becomes institutionalized within state, uh, state institutions, within committees, and so on and so forth. But they also get this secular credibility, and this is something that we also have already talked about. This change in language right and we have observed this change in language in uh, in in um, um, in, the, in uh, the discourse of uh, on abortion where abortion stopped being discussed as you know seen by ultra conservative actors or something that is against god's will but they start to talk about it as something that uh, affects women negatively and we have to protect women in the polish context i have been looking also at discourses around New reproductive technologies, and it was quite amazing how ultra conservatives talked about uh, fertilized eggs, which are cryo preserved, and they will not be um, uh, they will not be used in the procedure uh, because they have basically uh, low quality. I would say low possibility to be developed into into babies as um, minority group of people with disabilities. Right, so they become the, the group that have to be protected, and of course, what this entails is that the real um, minority groups become erased from the equation. They become those who are the danger to uh, the society, and therefore, uh, you know, the society have to protect itself from them. And our last conclusion is more general, but I hope it will hit home. Okay, um, I think we've all read these polemics that um, chastise feminists or LGBT groups um, for taking attention away from real problems of the left. 
um, polemics that blame identity politics for weakening the left, polemics that dismiss uh, debates around gender as merely cultural debates, whereas real politics is about economic issues. Our book is directed, in part at least, towards people who bought these to, who bought this argument to alert them to the fact that while the left or the broadly speaking liberal left is dismissing gender as, as unimportant, the right has learned to play gender to its advantage, to create moral panics around gender that have become a huge threat to democracy itself. So basically our argument um, is that the anti-gender movement cannot be viewed in isolation from broader political dynamics. It is in fact a key part of the resurgence of right-wing populism. In some parts of the world, I think it's time to call it fascism and authoritarianism. Gender is now a key battleground in the struggle for redefinition of the global political scene and the future of democracy. Thank you. Hello, uh, so first of all, big thank you for uh, creating this book because it really helped me and my country in creating a strategy. I'm from North Macedonia, so uh, your book has really helped uh, the civic society in Macedonia to create a better strategy in addressing the anti-gender movement. So uh, my first question is, uh, are you doing, are you continuing the uh, research specifically from a perspective of thinking post COVID? Um, I'm seeing this because for example, the main source of anti-gender movement in North Macedonia was a Facebook page called Prevzemi Odgovornost, Take Responsibility, which was first as an anti-vaccination page and creating disinformation about COVID, and then slightly shift into anti-gender as a new perspective in uh, creating um, suspicious about reality and everything that um, we stand for. And my second question is, would you argue that the feminine nationalism happening in the EU countries contributes to the current movements of anti-gender? Uh, thank you so much again. Yes, it's a really great question. Thank you for that. Because I also observed that, I mean, we are continuing our, our work because we sort of cannot get rid of that. We, <laughs> we hope that, you know, we will just, you know, when we started in 2012, we hoped like, oh, basically at the beginning, we also thought that it might be Polish, uh, Polish specificity. Unfortunately, it is not. Uh, but, you know, we, we continue and continue and continue and it develops and it develops and we are like, what the hell? Like, stop, finally. <laughs> but uh, yes, we are looking at that and it's quite interesting how, on the one hand, um, the anti-vaxxers uh, have been sort of moving from um, some of them from anti-gender or combining two positions and two key organizations uh, in Poland, uh, the uh, parental movement uh, Save Our Children, which originated with opposing uh, educational reform. Then they supported the uh, opposition to Istanbul Convention, to the ratification of Istanbul Convention. Uh, and now they are trying to save the children from vaccination, right? So it is very specific um, position vis-a-vis -vis the state. So the idea that the state should support the families, for example, financially, but should have no say in terms of, you know, how the educational system should work or how, uh, for example, the question of responsibility through vaccination should be, um, um, you know, realized. And Ordo Iuris Institute, they did it in a much more I would say because it's they are mostly lawyers, you know, like suit up and stuff. So they are usually like using this kind of very opaque language in which they talk about human rights being, uh, of course, uh, uh, in danger because of the idea that people would have to be vaccinated and especially children. So in that sense, uh, I would say those organizations have the tendency to fall into uh, this kind of um, um, trap, I mean, 
for me, it is a trap of conspiratorial thinking, but at the same time, they are clearly tapping into existing uh, anxieties of, for example, some parents who are afraid of, for example, you know, uh, the um, adverse outcomes of vaccination, and they want to mobilize those parents for their own needs as well. I can only add that there is actually a content connection. One of the um, uh, rumors that have been spread up around vaccines is that they make you infertile, and another one is that they make you gay. So, um, you know, so the, the, well, there's a way in which conspiracy theories um, attach to each other, and there's kind of fluid uh, inter interconnections between them. Your question about femo nationalism. Um, it depends on the context. In some countries, there is much, uh, the anti-gender movement uses women's rights. Um, and I think, you know, that that's a conversation or perhaps uh, empirical research to be had be uh, about the connection between uh, conservative feminism and the anti-gender movement. We, we don't want to make conclusions about this. Um, in Poland, not so much. Femo nationalism, it's rather the West wants to turn our women into feminists, then we need to defend our uh, women's rights against Muslims. That, that would be a frame that you would see in Holland, in Britain, in France, but not in Eastern Europe so much. Thank you. That was a really, really interesting, really clear and engaging and pretty mind-blowing talk. I'm definitely going to get the book. Um, and just to follow up on the femo-nationalism thing, I think in the UK we've got homo-nationalism. If you look at what happened in Birmingham with the Trojan horse stuff and the kind of protests that supported Muslim families in kind of protesting against LGBT inclusive education. The government came out saying that those, that if you want to live in this country, then you have to be gay inclusive. So that's homo nationalism. That's not my question though. My question is, there's a lot of rumors about where money comes from for anti-trans campaigning in the UK. And there's rumours, and I've heard journalists are gathering evidence that this money comes from very rich right-wing people in the states. I just wondered if you'd been following the money as well as the politics and what you thought about that. Yes, it's actually we as, as scholars unfortunately have very limited uh, possibilities to follow the money. And it's very funny when investigative journalists call me and say like, where do they get their money f from? And I'm like, I can't ask them that because they don't want to talk to me. And I, you know, I always have to tell them who I am because it's, you know, the ethical prerequisite to do an interview. So in that sense, we are a bit in the pickle of that in, in this respect. But um, there has been quite interesting um, research done by um, Open Democracy, for example, or uh, there is a, a report by uh, Neil Data uh, from a Brussels based organization, and they are quite able to follow the money. And of course, for example, if you look at the lobbying at the EU level, a large chunk of this money is from the United States, but you would have also uh, different strange figures like, you know, Brazilian and uh, uh, Mexican uh, moguls who support specific initiatives you will have also different types of uh, ways in which money from Russia is being poured into this kind of initiatives but what is interesting is that for example in the Polish context there has been uh, reports on the fact that because for example the uh, tra tradition family and uh, was the property, I always forget about property. Um, uh, how, how they function, they function as a franchise. So as they establish their uh, headquarters somewhere and then they sort of mushrooming all over the place and those new organizations are sending out um, letters asking for small donations and so forth. And then they sort of transfer the money to the headquarters. And there have been a legal dispute between the Polish organization and the uh, French headquarters Quarters, and it turns out that the Polish organizations have been uh, transferring millions of euros during the last couple of years because they have been so effective 
in gathering money from people in, for, in the form of small donations. And of course, in the Polish context, you have uh, um, a government who is able and uh, willing to invest a lot of money into uh, illiberal civil society organizations. So we have uh, quite a few new schemes which allow those organizations and which privilege those organizations in getting governmental money. Uh, and of course, this money is, for example, cut from supporting women's centers or centers for women experiencing domestic violence. And this is moved to those organizations which promise to protect the family or which produce uh, reports about the dangers of divorce. So I think that we are dealing with, of course, the usual suspects like the American evangelicals and so on, but also we can see how different, you know, how different sources are becoming really important in spreading the message, in supporting institutionally those organizations in different um, uh, regional contexts. Hi. Hi. Hi there. Sorry. Um, I've just got an online question here from um, Alice Forbes. Uh, she says, this was great learning. Would you say that the UK, because of its Brexit populist movement and actors, has made it dangerous and or inflamed the anti-gender undertones in culture? I'm, not, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understood the question. Could you, could you repeat or rephrase? Um, yeah, I think, um, I think what Alice is saying is, obviously we had Brexit in Britain, which was a, a very divisive, right-wing orientated um, process. And would you say that has um, amplified the, the sort of anti-gender um, in, in the society? I, I wouldn't be, you know, I haven't been researching the situation in, in um, England or in Great Britain, so I, I would be very, you know, cautious about making this kind of um, conclusions. But I think that this is part of a broader tendency, for example, which connects to growing nationalism, to growing a sense of, you know, we have to protect our own values, whatever these values might be, uh, against, for example, the onslaught of the European Union. And of of course, the European Union often is being pictured in this discourse as the promoters of gender equality, of those, you know, crazy feminist ideas which are being then um, um, used for, you know, colonizing the, the countries and so on. So I guess the basic uh, elements of this discourse are there, but the actual um, outcomes of those processes vary from country to country. And of course, if you think about the ways in which the question of gender is being used to deepen social polarization, you can also see this. And I think that this is not a coincidence that the issues connected to uh, trans rights and so on are be, have been sort of uh, growing in, uh, in, um, in the sense of you know, oppositional um, um, movements along with those processes which actually led to Brexit. Because I think that for, um, um, of course, we know that there are you know, forces and people like Putin, for example, who pour a lot of money into accelerating the processes of social polarization. And these issues often prove to be very easy to become those, you know, starting point and those points which actually make people uh, lean into one uh, way or another. But I, I can't talk about details because you are probably all better experts on that than I am. So I have raised my hands for a while now. Anyway, so uh, yeah, I appreciate you pointing out that the uh, anti-trans or anti-gender movement uh, is definitely like related to the authoritarianism. And um, I get your point of like um, saying that, I mean pointing out that uh, the anti-gender movement and the politics uh, cannot be just like separated uh, and look into it, like uh, 
each other. But uh, in your opinion, um, would it be possible for like uh, fighting for trans rights to become like non-partisan, or like uh, should that thing be like achieved? And what would be the benefits to trans people and trans rights in general if it had to be non-partisan? Well, it's it's a great question that I don't think the, I have the answer for because what we are observing actually, and that's what I actually believe in the conclusions um, um, of the work by uh, I forgot the, their names, Pippa Norris and Inglehart. Inglehart and Norris um, and this book on cultural backlash where they observe that in most countries especially what in developed countries uh, there is this tendency for the last two or three decades to actually um, change the uh, political divisions from left and right uh, which included both, you know, let's say cultural issues and, and economic issues, if we believe in this division, but okay, let's, let's pretend that we do, uh, into a very different type of uh, political cleavages where you actually focus on, let's say, lifestyle or identity issues are the main, as the main uh, political cleavages, the points of, uh, of, um, from which the polarization starts and accelerates. So in that sense, and if we look at countries such as United States, for example, where you have this clear tendency uh, for, you know, people's uh, views on issues connected to gender, sexuality, feminism, equality, uh, they become increasingly connected to their p uh, political party uh, identification. Um, I think that we have to have you know, ideas how to overcome it, this trend. But so far, I'm not, I don't think that we are very successful in doing that, right? Because the, the, the sort of zeitgeist goes into a totally different direction. On the other hand, uh, what you're describing as the goal for trans rights um, has happened to, uh, to, to gay rights. Right? You, you cannot any longer build uh, that kind of um, um, binary, that kind of struggle uh, around gay rights, because in the United States, I think it's over 80% uh, that now support it. So in a way, they've shifted towards trans rights, because that can still create that cleavage. So the question would be, um, how do you take trans rights from outside of that, from that dynamic? And I think Stephen in the morning suggested some of these strategies, which worked for some years, and then they stopped working for a number of reasons but it's not there, there I think I don't think there is anything um, imminently um, uh, there, there's nothing necessary about this role played by uh, being played by trans rights at this moment that's where they are but you know the future will tell whether what, and, and the, an interesting question is what would replace trans rights in the United States it's abortion and trans rights in Poland it's still gay rights and abortion and nobody has really touched trans rights yet so in a sense it's arbitrary it's, it's a structure that needs this element that will keep people divided um, but yeah hu humanizing uh, gays in the public view is really the strategy and you just have to keep doing it, making people realize that you're talking about human beings and not an abstraction. Uh, last question, I'm afraid. Yeah, I'll keep it quick. I think we're over already. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that. It was great. Thank you so much. And um, I appreciated how it's this uh, worldview that has its own internal coherence and its own intellectual heritage and so on. I wondered if you could say a, a little bit, maybe briefly, about kind of what are the internal contradictions of this worldview? Um, so what are the weak points? Because it seemed at times an almost insurmountable, um, undefeatable opponent. I would say there is a, a tension around uh, the possibility that the anti-Semitic subtext be revealed 
the, the, there is a need to reveal it because in a way everybody knows that it's George Soros. On the other hand, there is a need to deny to um, the, the, the very possibility of anti-Semitism because of the status of anti-Semitism in Europe, right? If you want to be mainstream, you cannot be an anti-Semite. But if you want to make coalition coalitions with the extreme right, which these people are making, then you kind of need to be an anti-Semite. So there is this whole dynamic of, of winking, you know, of making gestures that will make the, uh, you know, the, the, that part of the audience realize what's going on. Can you think of other contradictions? Well, I think that geopolitics also plays a quite important role, right? Because now the, this, the, 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 the people who have been like uh, Salvini, who had, you know, his pictures with Putin, uh, are, you know, displayed on social media and who praised, you know, Russia as the sort of beacon of light for traditional values, they are, they have to, you know, retreat quite quickly because apparently you know their leader um spiritual or ideological leader is is a mass murderer right and that that wouldn't fly anymore so it is quite interesting how these tensions between um you know geopolitics and sort of cultural politics um arise and how they become very important but i think another issue is quite important here uh the question of family Right, because the, this narrative around um, uh, around you know um, gay people or trans people as are as danger to children can fly only if you exclude uh, non heterosexual families from the from the family the family as as an institution, and of course we have a growing number of countries where you know it turns out that you can have very different types of families and sometimes even conservative politicians um, you know support this kind of uh, legislation because they are pro-family so you know if you look at this contradiction there is a lot of elements there which reveal if you actually look at them closely or open homophobia and transphobia or open racism right and i think that we have to call out those underlying elements um, and also when we think about the um, the uh, you know argument about protecting women in the polish context we have a, a mass mobilization of polish women who went to the streets in 2016 when this horrific uh, new law was about to be discussed in the parliament which would make uh, uh, which would introduce total blanket ban on abortion and also women who undergo abortion would face five, up to five years in prison and what the women's movement this new mass emerging women's movement said was to sort of take the narrative, take over the narrative and saying, we don't need you to protect ourselves because you are cruel barbarians who want to kill us. Right? And this is the sort of contradiction between the actual women who want to speak in their own behalf and those, um, those uh, organizations and actors who are claiming that they, you know, they want to protect us. So this is the moment where the fantasy is being, uh, being, um, um, you know, revealed as a cruel and horrible type of domination. And I think that this is what we need to do over